watching is just a teeny bit different than what you're seeing. Well, hopefully I'll be able to see what, what, the, what the little glitches on that and work that out for next time. But as long as you can hear me, uh, that's good. I can see you. I can see the chat there. I can see everybody rolling in. And um, <laughs> Vicki, you're shaking your head. Thank you. I appreciate that. I have a very warm lap right now because the cat decided to settle right down. She's laying right across the cord. So hopefully I won't get choked by this uh, <laughs> these earbuds here. But um, thank you, Patty. Um, hey, Betty. Hey, Marcy. Teresa. Mary. Pat. It's so good to see all of you here. Yes, yes, yes. My first time live. So let me just tell you just a little bit. Uh, I've certainly been on some other live shows, but on my YouTube channel, those of you that have been subscribing and have been around here, you know, I've got a lot of videos on there. They've all been done in a professional studio with the It's So Easy TV program. And truth be told, I got really spoiled by doing those and just hesitated a little bit on doing additional YouTube videos that were more homegrown because I just really just, you know, had all of those on there and uh, was a little bit worried about the, the comparison. But this to me is a great way to, to get to visit with all of you. Uh, I know many of you are, are uh, reading my note that I write to you. I call it my, my uh, weekend love note and I appreciate you so much. It's just really great to be able to have a live event and, and have all of you all of you here with me. So like I said, I've got a friend with me in the background and um, she may chime in a little bit here later on. We usually do a monthly uh, club program, we call it, at a local store, local uh, brother dealer where I used to, used to work and I still teach there once a month. And of course, since uh, everything's been changed this year, we haven't been able to get together there like we used to. So I've invited uh, those people to come come as well and kind of have one big little hangout uh, sewing party. What I usually like to do in those meetings is we talk about what's new in sewing. We have show and tell. Uh, it's very interactive, but then I kind of take the stage for a few minutes and give some tips and tricks and techniques. So I thought tonight it would be fun to uh, go through some of those things with all of you so that you could benefit from seeing that as well. And then of course, um, open to questions. If you can um, shoot them into the chat, if I can see them, hopefully I'll catch them. If for some reason I don't catch them, please feel free to put it into the, the comment section and I will make sure I go back and, and answer your questions. Of course, you always feel free to shoot me an email and uh, you know that I'll get back to you just as soon as I can and try to find an answer for you. I've had some interesting questions lately and I, I'm used to that, but I love it because it challenges me and it always makes me have to stretch my knowledge a little bit further uh, sometimes. And uh, some of your creative ideas really, really inspire me. So I hope to give you some creative ideas tonight and hope to inspire you a little bit. So I'm gonna try now to uh, go ahead and share my screen with you. So I'm gonna pull that up and share my screen. And there we go there. Share that. And I'm going to try to turn that into a slideshow. Okay, so hopefully you can um, see that. Let me um, leave it up there for just a minute. You should see uh, something that says, let's explore some neat ways to embellish necklines with machine embroidery. And I'm gonna go ahead now and I'm gonna stop that just to make sure I'm gonna pop back over to see you guys and tell me if you can see that. All right, so it looks like you can. All right, now let's see if the mouse works when I get back over here. So 
All righty. Pull that. Back. All right. Cat just jumped off and pulled the earbuds out with her. Tore the rubber off of one so I get that fixed. Gotta love a live show, right? Oh, now my computer wants to update. Okay, we don't want to do that. Thank you very much. I knew something strange would happen. I think she bumped the computer when that all took place. So <laughs> here we go again. Let's try this. Let's try this. You gotta love live. All right, so once again, are you seeing that? Are you seeing, let's explore some neat ways to embellish necklines with machine embroidery. Let me pop back and see if you can tell me you are seeing it. Yes. All right, I'm gonna see if I can advance the screens from here. Nope, that takes me back. That takes me back so you're just seeing me. Okay, well, let's get back there again. This isn't working quite the way I thought it would. I see yeses. I see yeses, but I don't know what the yes is. Yes, it's good. Yes, you can see. Yes, you can see me. <laughs> let's go back to this. In June, I'm going to unmute you and maybe you can. You might have yourself muted. Okay. Can you hear me, June? I, yes, I can hear you and I see you. And All right, go back to that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to leaf through these and hopefully um, you'll be able to see all these. I'll stop uh, periodically and check in with you and see how it goes, so. I'm gonna go to the next slide. All right, so some of you may have seen this on It's So Easy TV. I did a dress made out of a slinky knit, which was really fun. I don't know how many of you have sewn with uh, slinky knits, but slinky knit is not your typical embroidery base fabric. It is super stretchy. It is a uh, knit, obviously, and it is rather thick and it actually has pretty pronounced ribs in it. So when you think about something like that, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really going to be a challenge to do the embroidery work on it. So I came up with what I thought was a good compromise and I decided to do what I call off-site embroidery. So O-F-F-S-I-T-E. Uh, meaning I'm stitching it off-site and then applying it. Many of you are familiar with that from doing freestanding lace and that type of thing where you're doing it on water-soluble. I used netting. I used netting that matched very closely to my fabric. If you look at that one uh, picture in the corner, you'll see that my netting came very close to the, to the color of the fabric. I used two layers of it because it was a very fine bridal tool. And then I layered it between water soluble mesh style stabilizer. We also call that fibrous mesh stabilizer and put it in the hoop tight, 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 tight. That is one of my key tips for you. If you're doing that is to do that in a hoop where it's, you are tightening that fabric down, whatever is in your hoop really tight, because if there's any bit of movement, it causes a, the stitches not to fall on top of the spot where they're supposed to fall on top of. And then you could very likely have those pieces break apart. It's very important when you're doing embroidery on water soluble stabilizer all by itself in the case of those, um, those lace motifs. So you can see, I just did a, uh, you know, some roses that I took from ibroidery.com. Full disclosure, I am a, a brother uh, ambassador. Most of you know that. So I work uh, sewing machine wise exclusively with uh, brother, brother products. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna stop my sharing here and see if I can pull you all up and see if you're seeing that okay. All right, so 
We're good. All right. So now, um, now you're just seeing me and I'll go ahead and go back now that I know that that's working. Just making sure it's working. Next time I know what I'll do, I'll need two monitors so that I can monitor all of you on one screen and everything that I'm doing on another one. So now I already know how I can, how I can fix that. That's how you fix a problem, right? You cause one problem and then find a way to fix it. All right, so I'm gonna bring that back and then I'll go ahead and go to the, the next slide where you can see I then took that out of the hoop, rough trimmed around it and then took fine, sharp, curved tip scissors. Those are my favorite scissors to work with to trim close to up to the edge where that uh, embroidery stitches were, were, were finishing. I always leave just a little bit of that netting on the edges, on the outer edges for two reasons. Number one, it's very easy to accidentally cut too close. So if you don't think you're trying to cut too close, if you don't try to cut too close and you leave yourself a little margin, you have a much better chance of not accidentally cutting into there too far. The other reason for that is if you're choosing netting that is blending in with your fabric really well, it's not going to matter if there's a little bit there. In fact, you could leave even a wider margin and use that as the edge that you would want to stitch on so that you didn't have to stitch into the embroidery at all if you wanted to. That's another, another way to do it. Another reason for doing that is if you look at that, I've got some you know, some stem areas that are very, very fine and, and very narrow, and they need a little bit of extra support. When I go to stitch that, I'm not gonna have anything really to bite into. So by leaving that extra netting around there, I'm gonna have the opportunity to uh, keep that really, really strong and secure there and still be able to maneuver my stitching around there. Because that's gonna be the next step. I'm gonna prepare to stitch that. So. What I did for this particular layout, I sewed, first of all, I sewed the whole dress up to the point of side seams and hem. So basically the shoulders were done and the neckline was completely, completely finished. And then I laid out my, my um, array of embroidered roses there. Just visually, you could measure if you feel like you need to, but you know, maybe your neckline's not exactly perfect anyway. So Sometimes we're, we're doing some things better by sight than by actual measurements. If we get too crazy with the measurements, we may you know, throw things off a little bit. So just think about that. And then to avoid having to maneuver around sewing pins, uh, sewing around pins, I went ahead and glue uh, basted basically all of those pieces in. I really like a product called Roxanne's Glue Based, and it, it's a a really fine washable glue that comes in a in a little kind of accordion style tube. And you just need very small dots of that. So I put that all on the back and let that dry thoroughly. Now you'll see, I also have another whole big piece of water soluble stabilizer underneath there. And that gives me something to secure the rest of the neckline area and the rest of what was the dress so that it could um, have something to hold on to when I take it over to the machine. And that's really, I'll just flip back to that. That's really all there is to it. Then I just put my uh, zigzag foot on my machine. I use a clear uh, applique foot actually. And you can use thread that matches your fabric, mat blends in with your embroidery, or you could even consider using monofilament thread if you want to. I would just caution you with the, the monofilament thread or the clear thread. First of all, there are a million different kinds and you want one that is almost as fine as your hair because that's the kind that really blends in well and stitches nicely through your machine. The heavier, thicker ones really can be kind of, kind of tricky to work with. But the only issue with the monofilament is that sometimes it can cause uh, scratchiness against your skin. So be aware of that. If that's the case, then you probably are better off just sticking with uh, thread that is what we would call normal thread. I use embroidery thread a lot. And I know on that one, I just picked a, a kind of a medium blue and use that to tack 
tack everything down there. So, all right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take that down for a minute and come back to you here and see what some of your comments are. Okay. So good. Looks like you probably could have seen that. Yeah, it is a beautiful shade of blue. Janice, that's the kind of color you would wear really well. I've seen you in, in that color. And um, when, uh, uh, when you find a pretty color like that, it makes the designing all the more fun to match up. So those roses are available on iBroidery.com if you're interested. Uh, they're very, very pretty. If you can't find the file, I know if, if, if any of you have been to iBroidery, that is the official Brother Design download site, and it is literally loaded with embroidery design. So it can be a little bit tricky to find something. If you're looking for those specifically, please go ahead and send me an, uh, an email, uh, and I will find the link for you and send that to you directly so you won't, you won't have to work. Uh, you won't have to search for it. So those are fun to do. The other fun thing about making those types of, of uh, appliques basically is what you're making is that you can apply them to anything. You could uh, decoupage those onto, uh, you know, tables and vases and wall hangings and just about anything you, you can imagine by using a good fabric glue and not having to worry about stitching that on at all. Uh, the best fabric glues that I've found for that type of thing, I like the uh, Aileen's uh, Tacky. That's really a nice, a nice glue because it dries clear. And uh, there's another one that is generally used for gluing jewels, you know, Faux, faux jewels, um, a gem tack. It's called gem tack. So since this is not a brother sponsored show, I can I can name other different different products, and those are two of my favorites: Aileen's tacky glue and uh, gem tack. Okay. So you know I should have started though by talking just a little bit about neckline designs in in general. And yes, surely this will stay up. All mistakes and all. I will I will leave it up so you can you can view it later. It'll be on my on my YouTube channel. Okay, so don't worry about that. But let's talk just for a second about necklines and embroidery. Uh, is just the, that's the perfect spot to add embroidery. If you're thinking about you know different places that you want to add it, when you do anything that frames your face, it brings it brings attention to your face, obviously. And when we're with people, that's what we're looking at. You know, that's what we want to be looking at most of the time. It's fun to have embroidery maybe on your shoes <laughs> for something different to do. But um, a neckline is always a flattering area to do it. Uh, when I did all the, the wraps in my book, I purposely, you know, made things that would be, you know, things that you would use close to those areas on your in your neck scarves things like that so that uh, you would have that 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 pretty that pretty look and to me it's almost a substitute for jewelry a lot of times when i wear something that's machine embroidered close to my face i put the jewelry back in the uh you know back in the jewelry box and let my embroidery be the the embellishment that i'm that i'm wearing i don't know i think it was coco chanel who said uh put everything on and then take everything off but one <laughs> as far as accessories. So, okay, Patty, you made what mistake here? I made a mistake with neckline forgetting how heavy the embroidery would be. Aha, very good, very good uh, point to bring up. Yes, if your embroidery is too heavy on a lighter weight fabric, uh, it could end up tipping over a little bit <laughs> and maybe make your neckline gap or, or kind of um, look a little funny. So, yeah. That's a that's a really good that's a really good point. All right, you ready for some more slides here? Let me go ahead and pull that back up. Okay, and share my screen again. And there we go. All right, so the next one here is actually what I would have to say is an oldie but a goodie. Uh, there may be some of you here that remember it for. Uh, Quite a few years, about seven years, I believe, I, I had the privilege of writing for 
Designs in Machine Embroidery Magazine, which is now no longer being published. The company is still uh, viable and doing lots and lots and lots of things, producing a lot of things, but the magazine is no longer in production. And I made a pajama set for Designs in Machine Embroidery, and it did actually end up on the cover, but that, again, is a neckline design. Um, looks could could almost pass for a blouse that that fancy fabric that is one of my favorite fabrics i used crepe back satin uh, i love crepe back satin it is a synthetic fabric it's found in the kind of the bridal section of the department you know the uh, bridal section department of the big box sewing store so it comes in lots of colors it's very washable and really not difficult to sew. I actually have a, a tip sheet on my website for sewing crepe back satin. Again, if you can't find it, shoot me an email and I'll, I'll give you a direct link to it. But it is uh, just a really soft, luxurious looking fabric. It almost imitates silk, but it has all the care properties that we're used to with, uh, with synthetics. Again, though, a little tricky maybe to do embroidery directly on. It's slippery. It's thin and it does, the, the only negative I could say about that fabric is it does tend to snag rather easily. So if you've got something rough going against it, it, it sometimes will pick up, you know, and, and just uh, the fibers on the outside will, will snag a little bit. So it's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a delicate uh, fabric. But again, I didn't want to embroider directly on that. So I used, uh, in this particular case, a design that also is on iBroidery.com, but at the time it was built into the Brother machine that I was using. And it, it was just a border design, you know, just it really was meant to use, however, maybe in a corner or something like that. And then it had some edging that went along with it. So I use the feature that's built into many, 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 many Brother machines. You need to look and see if you have it. It is called applique function. And with that feature, you can select uh, one little key on the machine. It looks like a, like a shield. And when you're in embroidery edit mode and you select that, that icon, it automatically traces the entire embroidery design and adds a satin stitch to it. So I certainly could have done this the same way I did the blue roses, but I would have had uh, you know, areas that really didn't combine and look finished because there's, there's spaces between those motifs on that. So what I did is I used that applique function and completely stitched it on the water soluble with the tool. And when I was done, trimmed around the outside edge of that. And let's see, I think I might have a, yeah, got a slide of that. So you can see I stitched it on the water soluble the netting I used was a cream colored, so I didn't try to match my fabric per se. I just tried to make it so it would, you know, go with the embroidery designs and, and blend in. And then once I was finished, you can see in the corner picture there, I just trimmed really close to that, laid it on the, on the top. In this particular case, I did it prior to construction. Uh, again, when you're working with something really slippery, it's nice to be able to lay it on a flat surface and not have to fuss too much with it and pinned, pinned bows in place for that particular one because I had a little bit more area to work with and then did the same thing with the zigzag. In this case though, because I had that satin stitch applique finish going all around it, I used the exact same embroidery thread that I used for that applique. So it literally melted right in. And even if I zoomed in on that, you would see that that is just completely, you know, completely kind of uh, disappearing in there. All right, so I'm gonna pop back and see what kind of questions and comments you might have. So has, I wonder, um, have any of you used that particular feature? It was designed initially to make patches, really, so that you could take an embroidery design, add the satin stitch around it, and then stitch it out on water soluble and fabric on a fabric base and then water soluble. And then when you were done, you could turn that into a patch that you would sew on or glue on like the patches that you buy ready-made. That's initially what, what that was designed for. But I saw other potential for that and thought it would be a great way to make something 
really delicate and really, really pretty like that. So those are, those are my fancy pajamas. And that's one thing I love, 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 love to do is make fancy pajamas because they're just, it's just one of those things that you can, you can play around with a lot of fancy techniques and things that maybe you wouldn't normally feel comfortable wearing out on a day-to-day -day basis might, might be too dressy for your style. Uh, you can always dress up in your, dress up in your PJs. <laughs> Okay, I see um, Marcy has used that feature. Janice, I'm not sure if that is in your machine or not. I don't know off the top of my off the top of my head. And then June's telling me that somebody asked about the the pajama pattern. Uh, that pajama pattern is just an old butterick pattern. It literally is just a pullover top with a V neckline and elastic waist pants. So. The simpler, the better. In fact, that's maybe another little tip when we're talking about embellishing necklines. When you're looking for a pattern or you're looking for a garment to do the and add the embroidery on there, um, look for something that's pretty basic and pretty simple, and let your embroidery be the star attraction and be what really what really shines on there. Okay, Marcy, you did it for for names. That's a great. It'd be a great way to do that with uh, with name tags. Maybe we could do a future show, and I could just do all, uh, you know, kind of step by step on that. There's some some different ways you can use it if you have that feature, that particular feature. Maybe we'll do it in a future, uh, even a, maybe a brother sponsored show with uh, frame shapes that are built into the brother machines and adding that applique right around them. So. All right, I got one more for you here tonight. So I'm gonna. Go back to that and share my screen again. Okay, so last but not least, this is a tip and some ideas for you, some, some techniques for doing embroidery on a ready-made t-shirt. The things I showed prior were sewn from scratch. And I do love doing embroidery from sewing from scratch because you're dealing with flat pieces. Uh, you've just got a lot of potential to play around with the area before you sew it together. You can cut oversized pieces, do your embroidery, then put your pattern on it. There's just a lot of different ways that you can do it. But let's face it, a lot of us want to do machine embroidery on ready-mades and t-shirts are probably one of the most popular things we want to do embroidery on. Necklines though. That varies. Um, again, we all have different personal tastes, but I don't generally wear crew necklines that come up pretty high up on the neck. I'm just not really, really comfortable with that. I prefer a little bit more of a scoop. So if I buy a ready-made, that's pretty much the style that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for. But that creates a little bit of an issue when we want to do machine embroidery up close to that edge. We're dealing with an area that the fa we run out of fabric, basically. And one of my golden rules for machine embroidery is to always have your hoop full of fabric. Whatever hoop you're using, make sure that it's completely full of fabric. If you've got an empty space there, you have the potential for the fabric pulling a little bit. And if it pulls, you're probably gonna have puckers or you're gonna have your design that doesn't register, doesn't, you know, the stitches don't land where they're, where they're supposed to land right on top of each other. So I like to take a piece of um, fusible mesh stabilizer, um, poly mesh, this is commonly, commonly called, and mine has the, the fusible um, backing on it. And I lightly fuse that over a large area of the shirt larger than the position that I'm actually going to be hooping in because it's just going to help stabilize it. What I love about the, the, this particular one, this happens to be a brother product, but there, you'll find other ones out there, is the, the fusing is very minimal if you iron it very lightly. It's just enough to stick, but not enough to permanently fuse. So I fuse a large area and I let it extend beyond that neckline. You can see there obviously where the neckline ends and underneath it, what I did is I placed a piece of uh, cardboard there. And if I were going to um, be fusing that, I'm not gonna iron on that cardboard. I'm only gonna iron up to 
it's actually a manila folder. I'm only going to iron up to that folder and not, not fuse any, any further than that. But the rest of the area, I'm just going to lightly fuse that so that when I go to put that in the hoop, that neckline area is going to be, is going to be filled. And then I'm going to measure from the center. I'm, you know, embroidery is all about marking from, from the center. You can do it with a tape measure. You can do it with a ruler. Uh, there does happen to be a wonderful center ruler that you'll find at your brother uh, dealers. And it's, it's, you can see from the, from the picture there, it's designed for you to measure from, you know, from the center outward and mark everything evenly. So if I'm doing multiple things, I can, I can do that. So then the next thing I'm going to do is get that, get that hooped. And I don't tend to worry too much about the position. You could see I'm right on target now, but what I try to be concerned with when I'm hooping that, I, and I do turn it inside out when I go to hoop it, when I get that in my hoop, I just want to make sure the lines that I marked for the center, the horizontal and the vertical lines are perfectly perpendicular and parallel in my hoop. And I, maybe we'll do that in a future one too. I know I've got some tutorials on that online where I use the grid that comes with the hoop in order to make sure I have that lined up. I don't have to be perfectly on center though because I've got tools inside the machine. Virtually every machine has the ability to go and use arrow keys and move, move that uh, over a little bit. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna see what some of you might be saying in the, in the chat here. Okay, um, how many of you, I'm curious, have used your grid in your, uh, in your hoop to line things up precisely? Anybody done that? Because that is really the way to go to get everything lined up straight. You could get it right on center with that as well, and you do need to do that at times. But a lot of times, if you've got a little bit of bump room in your design, and that's where the that's kind of where the important part comes in here. If you choose a design that is uh, four, four, a four by four hoop, that's a little hard to say, but it's four or four by four hoop. And it is almost entirely filling that hoop. Now you lost that ability to bump. So if necessary, you might want to upsize your hoop one more size larger. So that once you get it hooped, you can then use those keys, and we call them jog keys, so that you can knock it over a little bit to the left, right, up or down, until the point of your needle points directly to that center marking. Then you're going to know that it is going to stitch accurately from where they where you marked it. And yeah, the grids don't come with. Um, every machine anymore. They're considered an extra accessory in particular with the Luminaire. But I think the reason behind that is because the Luminaire has a projector. So the projector puts a live image of the embroidery design right on your fabric and you can use that for alignment. I'm a little bit old school and I've been using those templates for so long that they kind of give me comfort in knowing exactly where my embroidery is going to be because I can I could see that area and I could see that gridded area you know represents the stitching field because that's what it actually 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 does. But Janice, you probably know those arrows on the machine to move the design are are just like one of the best best features built into there. If you've had previous machines that were you know maybe lower end or starter machines and you didn't have that. Uh, that really, really, uh, that really makes a big difference. And yes, you can, if you don't have grids that uh, with the Luminaire in particular, you can order them uh, as a separate, as a separate accessory. So just keep that, keep that in mind. All right, so I'm going to go back here because I got just a few more uh, screens to share you and, and then we can, um, we, I could you know, look at, at your questions and some things that you're, piping in here. So, all right. So you see that I got that all clipped. Uh, that's another tip. Uh, we all know we've, we've all done it. If you've done very much embroidery at all, we have all accidentally had something sweep under that hoop and get stuck. And we have embroidered uh, a part of our, 
garment or product that we had no intentions of embroidering in the first place. And very often that is um, really, really something that's uh, tough to deal with. So clip and pin, do whatever you need to do to get that all smushed out of the way so that you've got a clear field and just, you know, clear space underneath your, your hoop. I didn't show this part, but I generally speaking will add a layer of lightweight tearaway after I have fused that stabilizer to the actual shirt. I'll slip a piece of lightweight tearaway underneath and they call that floating. And I can tear that all away when I'm done, but it adds just another little extra layer. If I have fabric that again has a little bit of texture or ribs, you heard me talk about that before, then I will use a water soluble topper on top of, of the fabric. And you are better off hooping that water soluble with the hoop and getting a, a whole piece in there if you can. If you have a basting option on your machine, that's another choice. You could lay the piece down and baste it. But whatever you do, you want to make sure that water soluble is completely secure because if your embroidery foot catches that as you're stitching, uh, it can get wrapped up in there and you, you want to avoid having that happen to you. Okay, so I didn't show the actual uh, embroidered uh, part that I did at, at the machine, but you can see the backside here now because you can see where I tore away the extra tear away. And then what I like to do is just take all of that excess uh, stabilizer and pull it away. Cause again, it's not fused down permanently. It's just very lightly put in place. And then I like to trim, I like to leave a, a really good margin around my embroidery designs. Some experts will tell you, you only need a quarter to a half inch. I tend to err on a little bit more of a generous side, but um, I just think it helps kind of support the fabric around the stitches. It could also depend on the design. If your design is less dense, you can trim a little bit more away, but if your design's a little bit more dense, it just kind of gives a, a little bit more support in that area. And I like to trim it with pinking shears, just good old fashioned pinking shears. That tends to feather the edge a little bit so that from the outside, it doesn't show through as a hard, a hard line. So at this point, I would make sure all of my markings that I used my handy dandy blue or purple uh, disappears with air, disappears with water ink. And I will make sure I got rid of all that ink and then I will give it a firm, good steam pressing and fuse that entire stabilizer into place so that it is now permanent. And the results then that you get are a good looking shirt from the outside. You don't have puckers, you don't have buckling, uh, you don't have stretching in that area. And it just, everything comes out nice and neat and smooth. All right, so I'm gonna bring myself back here so that I can see what you've got. Okay, so Really, those are just things that I commonly do. I mean, those are like my everyday, ordinary go-to practices that I will follow when I want to create something with a, a neat neckline design, something that's going to flatter your face. And there are so many different options for choosing designs that you can, um, you know, spread around in an area like that. And uh, it just, it's, uh, it's really one of my favorite, favorite ways to embellish something is along the neckline there. All right, well, we have made it so far. We've been here for um, 45 minutes and uh, survived all of, the, all of the new things here to test and try. Hopefully uh, this will be the first of many and we'll be able to do more of these types of things. So I really appreciate having all of you here joining me. Uh, let me know if you have any more questions. If I see it starts to dwindle down a little bit, we'll probably just, uh, say goodbye, but I'm, I'm happy to answer, answer any questions you have. It's a little bit different than, than some of the other uh, platforms out there with, with YouTube because you're, you're, uh, you're doing kind of juggling a couple things at once here. So thank you, Cindy. Glad you were here. Hi, Dennis. <laughs> thank you, Cindy. Yep, Cindy says the grids save her embroidery. Very true. Hi, Doris. Definitely, Donald, yep. There's, um, 
you know, there's just a lot of ways to do different things. And a lot of it comes through, through trial and error, but uh, it's, it's, you know, every time we, I, I love to say that sewing people that sew, people that craft, people that create are almost a little bit like a pioneer. They're doing things that have never been done before. Sometimes the combination of fabric, design, patterns, you know, chances are you have never combined all of those elements before and it makes it something um, really, really different. Um, Kay, yeah, the grids in the hoops, um, it would be a lot better for me to be able to, to show you and I don't have a grid with me here tonight. I just have, I just have a hoop, but the grid would fit in there. It would settle in there and it would show the true center of that. So we'll save that for another, I'll do either another video on that. I'm trying to work things out so that I can do some on camera work as well. And uh, if I don't get to do that quickly that way, I will look up a tutorial and I will post it along with the, um, with the notes here in the video so that you can look that up. Cause I have done a step-by-step -step photographed tutorial of that showing you how to use, how to use those grids. It's one of the best things you can learn to do with any embroidery machine because no matter what, even if you if you have a camera, some of you may have, uh, I grabbed a sheet here. Some of you may have the handy dandy snowman markers. They all work great. There's all different ways to do positioning, but sometimes one works better than the other. Sometimes one makes more sense than the other just depending on the, on the whole situation, so. Thanks, Pat. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you, Connie. I love those spaces. <laughs> and Kay, very good. All right, so we'll, we'll, I will definitely post in a tutorial and add it to this video so that you can see how to use the, how to use the grids. I know I have one out there somewhere, so I'll, I'll dig that out and post a link to it so you can, you can go right to that. All righty. I think we're about ready to say good night. So I will wish you all happy sewing and we'll see you again. Bye now. <laughs>